Exploring the Bizarre. bizarre. Your e-ticket ride into the world of the paranormal. Strap yourself in as we traverse the universe exploring the unexplained UFOs, UFOs, UFOs ghosts, ghosts, lost worlds, lost worlds cryptozoology, cryptozoology, as well as other dimensions. dimensions. It's time to take back the night. Back the night. Back. Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bazaar, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. Well, I, I had to get that off my chest. Tim, I'm, I'm over here on, on this tree, w way up on the uh, top, uh, hanging from the vine. Can, can you see me? Well, I heard you yell, Tim. I thought maybe someone stepped on your foot. Oh, I tell you, I, I've just been here in the hot jungle uh, all day, uh, and I, we're, we're meeting up with the two of our uh, friends who are also swinging through the, uh, the trees here, because tonight, <laughs> what are we talking about, Tim? We're talking about lost civilizations, lost worlds, and antiquity. Mm -hmm. And tonight, we've got two very exciting guests that are going to be delving into the mysteries of, uh, of the lost worlds and unknown realms and UFOs. We've got my old buddy, actually, Jerry Wills from uh, Phoenix. Jerry and I actually played in a band. Well, it was his band. But if you go to... Um, my Facebook page, which I'm sure everybody does every day, you'll see a little photograph of me singing, and Jerry is playing the uh, right right next to me there, and Blue Ocean, the drummer, is in the background, and Sue Gordon was in the band, and we all had a great time, and I'm waiting for our reunion, because it always seems like everybody's back on the road again, you know? I'm actually going to see the Jefferson Airplane in August. These guys are like in their 70s, so I oh still got God. a few years, I still got a few years ahead of me. And, and I'm looking for it. But uh, Jerry is a, a very unusual uh, individual, very smart, very intelligent. He's got a world of information to share with us. He's traveled uh, throughout South America uh, looking uh, uh, for remote places and, and lost civilizations that most people are totally unaware about. And, and I'm looking forward to quizzing him about all these different uh, places that he's been to. And also some of them have uh, included uh, sightings, observations of UFOs. And uh, Jerry's going to tell us a little bit about his background. And he also does uh, a TV uh, uh, a show. And, and so we've got a lot of information coming up with uh, Jerry this evening. And then we've got returning to the microphone, Rick Osman, who also is a, a, an explorer, a cryptozoologist. Uh, he's big on the hollow earth theory uh, and, and all different aspects of the, the bizarre that we're very fascinated uh, with. And well, so don't, for, don't, forget, don't forget author. I mean, he, uh, author, he writes... Well, Right, writes for Ancient yeah, yeah. American Magazine, and he's got the book uh, The Graves of the Golden Bear, Ancient Fortresses, and Monuments of the Ohio Valley, a must-read book. Uh, I say that to everybody. you got to get this book and read it. Thank well, you, you know, I'm, I'm, si I'm sitting here with a copy of a book in front of me, and it's one that we published, uh, Tim. It was edited by Sean Castile, mm -hmm. and it has a terribly long title. It's called <laughs> UFOs Attacked Earth. Accompanied by warriors from Atlantis, lost cities, living dinosaurs, and a bloody arse pirate or two. <laughs> and it is the, the out-of-control universe of the late Harold T. Wilkins. When I was a uh, mere youth, which was only a couple of months ago, of course. Right. When, I, when I was a mere youth, I would um, uh, buy all the little paperback books that I, co I could for a quarter and 35 cents. That Does that uh, date me or what, right? I think the average paperback <laughs> book now is probably around nine ninety five or something like that. Right? Oh, and, um, really? And, uh, <laughs> and um, actually, I haven't bought one in a while. Oh, I don't know. Are they, are they still published? I would oh, guess. Yeah. So. Yeah. Rom romance novels and detective thrillers and things along that uh, uh, that line. But uh, Harold T. Wilkins was a collect. Well, he was an explorer and a collector of uh, oddities. And he wrote about lost worlds in uh, South America. And he wrote about dinosaurs that uh, apparently were still being seen 
in modern history. I mean, as early as uh, maybe 100 years ago even. Uh, in fact, there is a search all over the world for uh, what we would call prehistoric creatures, but they may still exist in, in certain uh, areas. And I know, uh, Rick, weren't you telling me that you read some of the books of uh, Harold T. Wilkins? Well, yes, I read not only the books, but, and I can't say I read it directly, but Dennis Crenshaw had some of the correspondence that Wilkins had sent back to his, his secretary, whose name escapes me. Uh -huh. But the secretary was aged, and he decided that someone else needed to take care of this stuff, and he gave it to Dennis Crenshaw. And to the best of my knowledge, Dennis still has it. So it was like daily reports, and, and it included the last three or four correspondences from Wilkins back to home. Uh, and, and, and what year? And, what year would that have been? Do you think? Oh wow! I want to say it was forty-eight, but I'm not uh -huh. certain of that. Does that yeah, sound well, about right? Well, I, I know he was a, he was around in the nineteen um, fifties. Uh, he wrote uh, a couple of the early books on uh, UFOs. Mm -hmm. Most of it was really what he had extracted from uh, newspaper, uh, you, you know, uh, clippings. But before that, he was, uh, I, going back to the 30s, he was writing about pirates and lost treasure. Mm -hmm. Because I know we, we did a book uh, uh, called uh, Spooky Treasure Troves, where UFOs and ghosts have led people to the site of buried treasure, or kept them away from it, for that mm. uh, matter. And he had a, a couple of accounts uh, in, the, in the book uh, about pirates and lost treasures, and he was writing about that in the, uh, I think, the 1930s, and then a little bit later on about the lost civilizations in South America. And, um, he, uh, you know, I don't remember the, uh, the exact detail of all his discoveries, uh, but uh, he, he was a very good writer. Uh, in fact, I guess he was a little bit before Frank Edwards, and they both kind of had the same style. They would take a long uh, story and kind of shorten it to uh, a couple of pages so that it would be easily uh, digested. I think a lot of their books were throw, uh, sold through like Scholastics and uh, the Weekly Reader for a very young uh, audience, but that's how I got a hold of them, and of course the uh, books of Charles Fort as uh, as well. So I, I was, kind of, you know, I was interested in in all of this when I uh, was was uh, growing up. Although UFOs, of course, became my uh, main interest because of my sightings that I had and uh, had some poltergeist experiences and, and things. But uh, uh, like I say, we've published this book on Harold T. Wilkins, and if you go to YouTube and type in Harold T. Wilkins, there's actually a British band who has done a very catchy song called Harold T. Wilkins. And I'm sure no, very few people know about it because they're kind of surprised when I tell them that. But it's the Harold T. Wilkins song. Hmm, and, I'm surprised. Uh, well, there, there, and it's actually, there you very, go. it's actually very catchy. Uh, you know. uh, anyway, uh, Rick, I want to thank you for being on the show once again. And I want to bring in uh, Jerry. Uh, Jerry, uh, you and I go back uh, quite a few years. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, probably a couple of decades now, I would believe, right? Um, we, fir we first met in Phoenix. Uh, I was uh, way before anybody else <coughs> who takes uh, credit uh, today. I was um, uh, organizing UFO uh, conferences, uh, mainly in Phoenix. Uh, the first couple of sh well, the first show that I put on there, I had so many people that the uh, the off the highway uh, ramp to the hotel. I guess we had closed down the highway. The, the traffic was backed up for at least a mile, uh, and every Every seat in the house was, was taken. And Jerry came in with some very interesting stories. He told, uh, I, I believe you were discussing crystals in those days, correct? Well, it's one of the things. I, mean, I was at several of your events. Yes. Oh, I know. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, I know, we, we, we actually, we put on some of these shows and everybody not only got educated, but we all actually managed to have a very good time because we bought in the music uh, and um, we had many different person, you know, personalities that were involved in the in the shows. The very contro controversial Bill Cooper, and of course, um, uh, our favorite uh, Jim Delatoso and uh, Sue Gordon, and and so forth. But why don't we start out, uh, Jerry? 
give us a little bit about your, your history, your background in uh, in the uh, uh, you know the offbeat and UFOs, and and how how did you get involved in all of this? Well, you know the the thing about the UFOs. I'll start with that, and I'll go on to the uh, the other. It really started as a result of my interest with um, things that were going on where I was growing up. There were really some very spectacular UFO sightings in that area. I grew up in Kentucky. Oh, that's where my dad is from, Shelbyville. Yeah, I don't think I was too far from there. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> there were sightings and things happening and cryptozoological things, Bigfoot, for example. Strange things like this were going on, and it really caught a lot of people's attention. Most of these folks, I'd say all of them probably, were a, a bit intimidated, and most were frightened. I was fascinated. I wanted to know more about it. Um, one evening, uh, I was outside stacking some wood, and there was this gigantic UFO I don't know what else to call it. It looked like a dirigible. It was, it was enormous. It just came floating across the tops of trees and parked right near these, uh, these power lines, these really high tension, large lines that went across the property, sat there with these lights that were just a pastel kind of color. And they were just very slowly coming on, going off, going in order one into the other. And I just felt like I had seen something remarkable, and I had. And it was after that that there were a whole series of things that took place. It would be, you know, several more months, but there were some really intriguing things that happened, including seeing these things land and ultimately having a chance to meet some of these folks during those early years. When you say meet these folks, we're talking about occupants? Yeah, that's right. Okay. That went on for about four and a half years. Then, uh, you know, during this time, I was, you know, during conversations with them, there were things that were being mentioned about Earth's ancient history, things that weren't being taught in school, things that were not really known. And I started looking into Edgar Casey and the things about Atlantis and... Psychic phenomena became quite an intriguing thing for me as well. I was very psychic when I was younger. And I just jumped into this arena, complete, you know, heart, mind, soul. And I vowed to myself that as, as I would get older, eventually I knew I had to go and take a look at, at some of these places I didn't know how it was going to happen. I wasn't wealthy. I wasn't really in a place where I could just gather a few thousand dollars to go do something like this. But I knew I needed to do it. And eventually it did come to pass that I made it down to South America, to Peru. And one thing led to another, and I started up a company uh, that took people down there. And it was based on a book that was very popular at the time. Well, it was about to become popular. It wasn't popular yet. It was a book called The Celestine Prophecy. Mm -hmm. I had spoken with James Redfield and told him my intention, what I wanted to do, because I was, I'd already gone to Peru once and I wanted to go more. And he says, well, you know, as long as you give me credit for the name, and don't forget my name or the name of the book, then, of course, I don't see any problem with it. So I developed a tour that was based on the Celestine Prophecy. And that went on for quite a number of years. During those years, there were a lot of things that happened. Um, a lot of things that were learning experiences. You know, Jerry, before you do uh, go on, though, I, I, I want to get back to your, your contacts. Now, who exactly was it that you were contacting and are, are we, we're, we're talking, I would gather, uh, uh, human-looking uh, ETs as opposed to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, they were, there were a couple different types. But basically, by and large, they looked just like regular people. 
Well, there was a little bit of a difference here and there, but nothing that you would notice in a crowd. Uh, they were just like people. Yeah, the, the, the other ones that I met, <clears throat> there was an occasion when uh, I got very sick. Um, didn't know if I was going to live or not. Of course, I mean, when a person gets sick, you probably say that to yourself anyway. But I was, I was quite sick. The doctor said that I had um, typhus and some other thing going on because we had drank water out of a well that rats had fallen into and died. And, well, I drank a lot of water, so I was drinking a lot of that water. So anyway, I was very sick. And in the middle of the night one night, <clears throat> these um, other types showed up that weren't human-looking. And, well, one thing led to another, and I was whisked out of the house, horizontal. It was very cold outside. Into uh, one of three ships that was sitting out. One was sitting on the ground, one was above the ground, one was in the distance above the power lines. And I was given uh, an inoculation of some sort in each arm. And as a result of that, I was fine. But while I was in there, uh, I saw quite a few things. And uh, one of them was one of these people that I'd been talking to who had been coming and visiting periodically. And it was explained to me that this is another group and that they uh, were working in the same cooperative effort, not to be afraid of them, because I was. I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. I've never seen anything quite like that. It all turned out quite well. But there are others out there, too, that aren't very friendly. And I was brought uh, into a place where I would understand more about them as time went on. You know, the, the ones that were friendly were about five foot tall. They had the egg-shaped kind of head and eyes and all of that, but they were more of a whitish-blue color. I eventually met those that were smaller than them, probably three feet tall, maybe three and a half, that are more gray. And those are the ones I really didn't care too much for. They didn't seem to be very friendly, and there were a few occasions where I, well, I, I just let them know I didn't care for their presence. So, uh, did any of them ever uh, give you an idea of why they contacted you in the first place? Well, they did. I don't want to go into it, but they did, and it was a, a valid reason. Mm -hmm. You know, there were a lot of others. It wasn't just me. They they were they were getting in touch with, let's say, quite a number of others. If you've ever read Whitley Strieber's Secret School. Um, I, you know, when I, when I first read that, I thought that Whitley Strieber had taken something that I'd said and written a book about it. I really did. But then, um, when I started examining what I'd said, where I'd said it and so on and so forth, I really hadn't touched on quite a number of the details that he mentions in that book so I, I quickly dismissed that idea it was just that first glance is like oh man how did how did this happen well the thing is they they were in contact with quite a number of youngsters uh during this time and i don't know how many i mean I, apparently it was you know a few maybe more than a few and i was just one of them just one of those that they had contacted mm. It's, it seems like sometimes, you know, you, you read about all of these encounters that, you know, people report having. And, I mean, it just, it, it, it's like there's a plethora of, uh, of different races and civilizations visiting Earth. It's almost like we're the truck stop of this arm of the galaxy. Well, you know, and I wondered about that as well. There, there was um, a time when I understood it a little bit better than perhaps I even do now. But the thing that I think is the underlying reality with all of this is that these folks have been here for as long as there have been people. And there have been people on this planet for a very, very long time. 
the um, the other part of that is that the um, you know there's another another group that aren't very friendly and they've been here for a very long time as well uh, what they explained to me was that human beings us life on this world you know what we call human beings we really aren't humans but that's what we all know each other as technically but uh, using that as as the um, as the mode of identification humans did not originate on this planet and life didn't exactly it, not even in any way did it evolve from one kind of species to another, another human to another human, and so on and so forth. Um, they're very distinct races. And there are out there, and I've seen them. And, you know, when you take a look at some of these, what do you want to call them? I don't know, interfering people, the dark forces, whatever. I mean, I, I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist. But the not-so-nice guys, let's say. You know, the, there was a time when humans were manipulated genetically. Mm -hmm. And it was necessary to do, I was told. Because if you actually had the long life that you should have, you also have a lot of time to learn, become wiser, and develop your inner skills and abilities. You know, an example of what I'm talking about is just like this thing I do when I'm working with someone as a healer. And I do that worldwide on a daily basis. Day and night, I work with folks. That is a psychic skill. But I don't see that psychic skill as being something that is unique to me. It's just unique because I know how to access those capacities, those abilities. But I think everyone has it. I think if, if you just had an opportunity to get out of the fog and have a chance to find out who you really are, you probably would develop it on your own just fine. All right. Well, we are coming up to a, a, a break in just a, a few seconds here, gentlemen. So I'll interrupt you now, and uh, we'll continue this conversation when we come out of it and uh, when we do come back we will bring in rick osmond and find out what he's been uh, up to now back to exploring the bazaar with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal your hosts timothy, timothy beckley, beckley and tim swartz and I just want to give a great big uh, welcome to everyone who is listening to the show tonight. If you've never heard us before, welcome. We're glad to have you and uh, tune in every Thursday night at this time. Um, uh, Tim Beckley and myself, we always have a fascinating program for you. So let's bring in uh, uh, Rick Osmond. And uh, Rick is a, a good and old friend of mine. Uh, he lives uh, here in southern Indiana, actually. I could probably just go out the door and shout at him and uh he would answer back we live that i thought uh, we yodeled here that's right there you go we do, do like the slim whitman yodel at each other <laughs> how you been tim we haven't hey, talked often enough i know i know rick it's uh you know it's it's summertime here and um uh, I you know I spent the I spent the half the day today at Holiday World with my daughter so so now I'm just a nice sunburned uh, piece of bacon so <laughs> of course she comes out of it unscathed now you you would think that you know I mean she's nine years old you know you'd think she'd have more delicate skin than I would <laughs> oh I I think she's as tough as nails is what I think. There you go. She is. Well, Rick, I'm going to put you on the spot right away here. The last time that we talked, you were saying that you were in the process of uh, uh, either were you starting or finishing up a uh, a new book. I'm actually working on two simultaneously. Oh, and, okay. And not having enough progress with either one, really. Uh, I but know that is. I'm still working on a Hollow Earth book. Yeah, that's the one I was referring to. And I've also started on a another book in the archaeology pre-Columbian history arena. Mm. 
and um, wow, I, I hit one thing over here, and I'm working on it, and something hits over here, and I have to go do that. I've been to wow, I've been to Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York in the last month. Really, a month, and a half, month and a half. Yeah. Is that in the physical body or through astral projection? <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> well, some of each, but uh, no, I've physically visited all those places. Did I say Iowa? Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, okay, no, let me just ask you, Rick. You haven't been wearing a uh, a black trench coat and wandering the uh, rural roads of Iowa, have you recently? No, certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if you heard about that, but I, I guess that uh, they're near the Mississippi, near Davenport. I guess people have been uh, seeing men in black trench coats uh, uh, wandering the rural roads there. Well, it, it wasn't me, and no, I wasn't in Davenport. I was uh, further down. I was actually very near the Missouri line. Hmm. But uh, Okay, well, can I, can I ask what you were looking for? Well, it's an archaeological site. That much mm -hmm. we're convinced of. Now we have to determine... Some age, um, it's got raised berms that, like you find, you know, fortresses in Ohio have these, the ancient fortresses. But this is in Iowa, so mm -hmm. this, this is like new. So we're trying to do some verification, try to do some uh, everything from dendrochronology, you know, studying tree rings to soil cores and whatnot to try to determine an age for some of this stuff. But what we can say is that much of the soil at this site is imported. It doesn't occur there naturally. Really? So it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of weird. So now are you, are you talking about a timeline possibly, you know, like uh, all these sites that you have uh, uh, visited recently? I mean, are, are we looking at maybe uh, all of these uh, being up at around the same, uh, same time in the past? Uh, yes. Okay. At, oh, at the same time period. I mean, right? Yeah. Um, and we're looking at 600 BC to about 600 AD for most of this stuff. Hmm. But it is a vast civilization. So there you go. Well, okay. Now, now, now I don't think that I have heard that much about um, that kind of stuff in Iowa, though. Right. That's why this is new. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> But it, we found sites in Wisconsin, uh, even western Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Now, I wasn't involved in that, but they exist. And uh, a few in southern Missouri. So it's on both sides of the Mississippi, which is significant as far as I'm concerned. Well, now, who, what, what exactly are the, uh, the sites? I mean, what, <laughs> uh, who, who, who was responsible for them? That is a great question. I wish I had an answer for it. <laughs> um, we think that there were actually two groups, and they were more or less in constant warfare. Mm. And um, and some of one group were very tall and muscular individuals, mm -hmm. and the other group was more normal size, even for the time, which would make them, you know, five feet, five and a half feet tall. The other guys were like seven and eight feet tall, mm -hmm. and they were the aggressors apparently. And, but and what, these, what time period are we are we talking the, about here? The terminus of this coincides more or less with the end of the Adena culture, as it's named in Ohio and well surrounds. But we never had any evidence of it west of the Mississippi until mm -hmm. now. Well, how, how many years back would that be? Uh, 1,000 B.C. to 600 A.D., maybe some people say 450 by the time it collapsed, but I don't think it truly collapsed. I think it was overtaken by and absorbed by another civilization. In Ohio, they would call that Hopewell. But, you know. Yeah, well, that, I mean, there's, there's a lot of Native American legends, you know, especially here in the Midwest of uh, um, the uh, of them running into... Uh, taller than normal, uh, aggressive tribes. True. <laughs> well, and even Captain John Smith, right. uh, af after he got done with Pocahontas, he went up this. <laughs> oh, let's not bring Pocahontas up. <laughs> <laughs> not that Pocahontas. Um, <laughs> the, the historical figure, Pocahontas. Anyway, he went up the Susquehanna River to, you know, engage with the natives and try to trade and all that stuff. And he came upon the Susquehannocks, as he called them. 
in Pennsylvania, and uh, you know he was probably five four to five six, but he was amazed at these people. These men were seven feet tall and muscular and graceful and uh, very strong, and he was a skirt of them. But he actually recorded that they were giants. Mm. And uh, they were. I mean, you can still find their tools, and they're much bigger than a normal-sized man can wield. And I'm talking about a normal-sized man now. So, pretty convincing. Well, yeah, but then, you know, you have... um you know, say like the uh, traditional historians. I mean, uh, they don't talk about that very often. <laughs> they don't want, if to. at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, but, and it's not just them. You you go down to the the Cato's off that were on the coast and just off the coast of South Texas, mm. and then they their civilization extended all the way halfway into New Mexico, maybe further. But they uh, they were seven feet tall. And as late as 1941, they were still b digging up these very large skulls uh, and publishing the picture in the newspaper, which, by the way, is in my book, um, used with permission under Title 18 USC. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, the idea that there were no giants is bogus. And when uh, TED Talks took it down that Jim... Uh, uh, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Anyway, um, they took it down because they couldn't get any scientific evidence that there were giants. And yet, the only institution in charge of all that, basically, the Smithsonian, has in their journals that they were bringing back all these skeletal remains of giants to the Smithsonian. Well, well now, I, I, I have to ask this. Okay, They're, like you mentioned the Smithsonian, we know that uh, they have... Uh, on several occasions uh, commented about the giants and the lack of evidence and none existing and so forth. Why is there such a determination among the uh, archaeological community to suppress the fact that there might have been different sizes of uh, beings that existed? I, it, it doesn't seem like uh, that's some earth-shaking news that would rock the uh, you know uh, uh, world and cause the stock market to uh, collapse or something. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it doesn't seem that way. But if this, I'll call it a race of giants, but I think it was just a very tall tribe of people, um, they were in control of North America for all mm -hmm. intents and purposes. And parts of South America get back to some of Jerry's travels, they were noted by the conquistadors in South America, Central South America, the mountainous regions primarily. And in Central America, at Palenque, when they finally dug up this sarcophagus that Eric von Donneken said was, you know, a guy shooting himself into space, Lord Bacall, <laughs> if you turn it sideways, it's a tunneling machine. But that's a whole different story. Anyway, according to the archaeologist who opened that tomb, and by the way, that box was empty. All of the remains were in a, another room to, altogether. Pakal was eight feet, four and a half inches tall. Wow. <laughs> so this was a race of giants, so to speak, who were leadership material, obviously, and are credited in a lot of civilizations with bringing knowledge of mathematics, astronomy, engineering, and probably um, civilization. So, maybe the little people don't want to hear that. <laughs> the little people who are in government now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, I, I can't, uh, I can't remember the person's name now. <laughs> he's going to, he's going to kill me. We had him on our, um, our other show, uh, exploring the bazaar, and, and he basically he had a theory that uh, that this race of giants may have actually have originated, say, like in Mesopotamia. Um, back in the just, uh, I mean, way, e even before acknowledged 
uh, uh, developments of society and that they, they kind of like spread across the globe um, at one point, including you know North and, and South America. And while there wasn't a lot of them, they brought with them um, laws, so to speak, like you, know, like you referred to. Uh, they were good businessmen. Actually, and uh, I mean, they they were the ones that really helped establish uh, a trading, yeah, uh, and, and things like that between tribes, which you know, which really is you know a great way to start a civilization. It is, and that's pretty much what I am studying: is the trade, not only the trade routes, but how they communicated their needs for trade, mm-hmm. which which is becoming more and more fascinating with <laughs> with pretty much each trip. So, just. Look at it this way. A cell tower is part of a line of sight network of communications. And if you can do it with radio waves as a line of sight, you can do it with light as a line of sight. So each one of those hills where those towers are was probably used in the past with a different technology. And what was this technology? (laughs) Reflected light. Reflected light. Yeah. Okay. US- yeah, I've heard of some uh, like vessels and all that use the, uh, the lights and all during uh, mirrors during combat. Correct. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you can use it in a civil fashion, just like in the 1800s up to well, 1960, we used a telegraph. The technology has overspread that, but the techniques, the actual transmission, is basically the same. Except you don't need a wire to go from hilltop to hilltop, just a beam of light. And if you can use Morse code um, with a key on a wire, you can use Morse code with a mirror and a light. Well, now what what evidence uh, is there of this? Have people found, uh, have mirrors been found? Not mirrors as we think of them as mirrors, although in a couple cases, yes. In most cases, it is a sheet of mica. Mica, if guys our age, Tim... We remember when the old kerosene stove had a window in it that was made of mica because that's right. <laughs> it wouldn't burn mm-hmm. and it it didn't break easily. It's flexible and it transmits light, but it also reflects light, particularly from sunlight. And it has a has the capacity to polarize light. So you can use one or two of these sheets of mica, size of your palm, and bounce a visible signal up to, oh, I don't know, five or six miles, Mm -hmm. depending on the atmosphere and whatnot. Uh, The U.S. Army set up a network in 1889, I believe it was, that transmitted by Morse code a sunlight signal 286 miles. And, of course, it did this in a matter of minutes. Wow. (laughs) Well, so now you're you're saying, in effect, that uh, these... uh uh, the individuals who existed going back many, many years, centuries, eons, uh, were more intelligent than we would give them credit? I think they're more intelligent than we are, or were. <laughs> That's not saying much sometimes, you know. <laughs> well, I, I concur. But there, it's not just the micro. There are other bits of evidence. Um, you'll find in large Native American artifact collections a piece of stone that is cut and bored into a tube and it'll be labeled as a tobacco pipe. Only one that I found out of several dozen that I've examined with my own hands and eyes had ever had anything burned in it. Mm. They were, I believe they were a sighting device and they didn't need lenses. It just needed to concentrate your attention on that point in space where that signal will come from. Oh, Some, sure. Okay, we used, wait a minute. We, let's, used, let's, uh, let's we used to there. do that when we were kids, you know, with okay, like a, a, a paper tube. Let's yep. stop there a minute, though. When, uh, when you talk, they're, they're looking into space? No, they're looking at the, the point in their space where that signal will come from on the next hilltop or that hilltop okay. four or five miles. And, and how, how, how far do you estimate that messages could be passed uh, uh, around? Well, with a flashlight today, at night, of course, uh, 11, 12 miles, Mm -hmm. if there's not too much light pollution. That was part of the purpose of having this tube. 
so that you didn't get distracted by anything else that was going on or maybe look at the wrong hilltop because it was a network. So there were signals going everywhere. Oh, okay, but they were doing this as not at night. They were doing it both day and night. It, well, they what, would what would they what would they use at night to power the? Uh... A flame. A flame. Okay. Um, probably with something that burns bright and hot, and they would need quite a bit of it, like grass, as an example, dried grass. Um, some types of dried leaves as well, but. The idea of this communication scheme is that you use a pulse. So I contend that it was faster in the daytime because the sun never goes out. But at night, you have to let your fire burn down so that uh, you can have a pulse rather than just a fire. God, a pulse will stand out. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we see, I mean, there there are places still uh, that that use this very same type of uh, of method. Uh, I, I know I was reading that. What was it like? The uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan would communicate that way with uh, just a hand mirror. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> and uh, and the joke was on the army, our U.S. Army, because the radios didn't have much reach through those mountains. Hmm. But but from the mountaintops, that mirror can go, well, as much as 10 miles, depending on how big the mirror is. And and do you think, though, that they had it set up like a, a like a relay where one mountaintop could, would send it to the next? Or Yes. Hmm. And I believe, and someday I may prove, that this extended pretty much all over both continents. Hmm. And a similar system different code, different technology was used by the ancient Romans, and we actually have history for it. Yeah, I, I, I seem to remember reading that, you know, like in school, you know, that the Romans would, would use that from, from hilltop to hilltop. But yep. it, was a, it was a method, though, that they had gotten from somebody else you know, from an earlier they, time. The right? only thing Rome ever invented was a professional army. <laughs> well, and some really good concrete. But. Right, yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, well, you know, you talk about sending messages through, um, uh, through uh, uh, light communications. You know, uh, uh, that was actually in the early days of the uh, UFO uh, uh, movement. Uh, that was how a, a lot of the uh, uh, individuals like uh, oh, George Hunt Williamson and, um, oh, I can't remember the other fellow, uh, uh, Otto. Maybe it was John Otto out of Chicago, were claiming to uh, to uh, communicate with uh, these uh, extraterrestrial beings or ultra terrestrials, as I like to call them, was was through a, a light communication uh, device. And uh, when I was in uh, England, in fact, we talked about this on the air uh, a week or so ago. I actually had the, um, uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, make contact, or uh, uh, at least I, I believe that I did with some. Uh, unknown object that was hovering in the sky uh, above the uh, oh the uh, the town of Warminster, and uh, I was there with a friend of mine, uh, 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 Arthur Shuttlewood, who was the editor of the local newspaper, and apparently he had had a, a, a communications with these beings uh, quite a few times, and we saw this thing hovering up in the sky, and he went to his uh, the trunk of his car and came back with a very large um, a flashlight of some sort and a t uh, torchlight, I would call it, and, and handed it to me and said, start blinking at, these, uh, at, these, uh, at this object. And whenever we would make a, uh, an attempt to communicate with it, it seemed like it was responding to our uh, uh, attempts. So uh, light seems to be, uh, a, of course, Stephen Greer, too, uh, who's mm -hmm. uh, uh, talked about this on many occasions, claims that he's able to, to go out at night and send signals to uh, objects in the sky and sometimes get a response. Seems to work even today. Yes. And the, the transmission of light through atmosphere is you know something that pretty much anybody would understand if they mm -hmm. had any technological uh, aptitude at all. So it's possible. 
I mean, it's clearly possible that they could have done it because they had technologies that could do it. Even just a little piece of crystalline mica that they dug up someplace would act as a mirror sufficient to be a hand mirror, much like the Taliban used today. So, hmm. well, I, I mean, I know I, I, I've I've read that they have found at you know like various archaeological digs. You know, like mica that did not come from the area. That obviously there had been, you know, pretty much a uh, uh, an extensive trade route uh, for mica, uh, yes. really all across the United States. It seemed like. Yes, it it traveled hundreds of miles many times. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was trying to think where. Uh, do you know offhand, Rick? Where uh, where where is there good locations uh, for to to find mica? Less so now because of the kerosene stove industry, but oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> South Carolina and New Mexico had oodles and gobs, but it's pretty much mined out in South Carolina, and mm-hmm. it's had a pretty big hit in New Mexico. Uh, I was just reading about the archaeological digs in and around the New Mexico mining district. And of course, they're still mining it, but for different purposes than windows and kerosene heaters. Mm-hmm. Um, it goes into a great deal of electronics gear and some high-end, high-technology optical gear. It's a so great insulator be, for both heat and electricity. So you would be able to then, with this technique, I mean, you'd be able to maintain communication, really, I mean, for hundreds of miles, if not more, you know, by, uh, back in ancient times. Correct. And detailed information, not just, hi, how you doing? Right, right. Check you, out you... my new post. <laughs> check, check out my pic- Check out this picture of my cat. Yeah. <laughs> Although I think they did some of that, too. Probably, yeah. probably, yeah. Well, Tim, I think uh, uh, we're going to be coming up on a break uh, pretty soon. Oh, I guess we're coming up on it right now. So, oh, we're at the top of the hour. So we'll be back in a few minutes with more Exploring the Bazaar. Exploring the Bazaar. Your e-ticket ride into the world of the paranormal. Strap yourself in as we traverse the universe exploring the unexplained. UFOs, 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 ghosts, ghosts, lost worlds, worlds, cryptozoology, cryptozoology, as well as other dimensions. It's time to take back the night. night. Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bazaar, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. Well, Tim, what have we learned during the first hour of the show? that there's a heck of a lot about our planet that we are totally unfamiliar with and that the public at large is totally ignorant of this fact because the archaeological and scientific community would like to continue us uh, to continue uh, to keep us in in darkness uh, just like uh, the powers that be uh, have the same attitude about uh, UFOs and so what do we do Tim on exploring the bazaar <laughs> well, we we tell people the stuff that they don't want you to know, uh, and, and we tell it in a, a down to earth, factual manner. That's right. Um, and tonight we have uh, two very fascinating uh, guests on. We've been uh, talking uh, to uh, Rick uh, Osmond for the last uh, half an hour about the uh, giants and and how these uh, individuals were able to communicate uh, with each other over vast distances, and how there's evidence that they uh, that this race of uh, uh, tall humans once existed on the planet, but it's keep uh, being uh, kept uh, from us. And uh, we also have out there in Arizona, what's the temperature out there the last few days, Jerry? It's been, uh, actually, yesterday and today, it's not too bad. It's been in the 90s, the days oh. before. That, it yeah. was 106, 108. Well, it's a dry heat. That's what they <laughs> always tell me. Well, that's true. At least, you know, when you see the smoke coming off of your skin, it isn't that oily smoke. It's that fine, <laughs> dry smoke. Well, now, how, how would you compare the temperature in, in Phoenix to some of the places that you've traveled to in South America? Well, to give you some idea, uh, 
A lot of people think that the Amazon is hot and muggy and totally miserable. It is hot and muggy, but it's not as hot and muggy as Miami. That's hot and muggy. <laughs> or Tampa. <laughs> and as far as the heat in the desert, well, deserts are deserts. When you go to the Nazca or Pulpa Desert, it is crazy dry there, probably drier than it is here. And because you're nearer to the equator, uh, the sun is a hell of a lot stronger. So I'd say that that desert, <clears throat> even though I've been in both, those deserts here and there, that is by far a much harsher desert. As far as on top of a mountain, I've been 15, 16, 17,000 feet in elevation looking for things with Kathy. And that is a trip. Because when you're standing in the sun, you're absolutely cooking. But if you go in the shade, you're freezing. There is no in-between. Well, why don't you take us back a, uh, a few years? When did you start your expeditions or your tra actually your, your adventures? I would assume maybe the first couple of times you went on uh, to, to South America uh, that you were not uh, organizing a group that uh, you, had, uh, you and Kathy had uh, gone there on your own? It would be right after we got married. Uh, mm -hmm. say around 1999, uh, we were probably still doing trips off and on from that point forward. But, uh, at one point we moved to Peru. Uh, we went down there, lived in the jungle, uh, for nearly a year. And during that time, um, well, we discovered quite a few things and places. We moved there because we wanted to go looking for lost cities. And we had gone in to places looking for lost cities, one of them being a, a very remote and dangerous area held by terrorists and narco-traffickers. We got in. Uh, we got rescued out of there by a large helicopter uh, by the special forces, Peruvian special forces, and got you know taken back to the military base and made our way back to Lima. But we had great adventures, and we found amazing things. And a lot of these things that we found, I would say most everything that is startling and totally unpredictable, we would not have guessed we'd have found it. These are relics from another age where mm, these people were pretty damn smart. They knew how to do things that we don't have any idea about right now. A good example of that is going up to uh, Cumbamayo. Now, this is a waterway that is to channel water from a glacial lake down to uh, a town several dozens of miles away. And they made canals to do this in solid rock. They are so precise, the water does not wear against the side of the rock. And we're not talking a little dip in the rock. In some places, we're talking three, four, five meters, a wedge cut out straight down into solid granite. And it goes on for 100 feet that way before the little rise of the hill uh, allows the canal to crest on and, and continue. In some cases, they burrowed tunnels right through mountains to do this. So precise that it is the exact same size one end to the other without any deviation from one end of the mountain to the other. If you fire a laser, it would just hug the wall. There is nothing that's a deviation there at all. And they built a hydraulic system into this canal system, a natural hydraulic system where they would angle the rocks in a certain way, the water pressure would hit, there would be a widening, and it would slow down the water changing its pressure, causing it to go deeper, the hydraulic pressure being changed by the design in these rocks. If the water flow got too high, it automatically did this. Thing is, there's no debris. You can't find any evidence of them making a mistake. And we've looked. There isn't any debris. There aren't any mistakes. It's absolutely perfect. And as a matter of fact, it can curve around a stone wall, so they made it look beautiful. They didn't just make a hole, just a, a vein for water to come through. They made it look 
beautiful. Well, Jerry, who are they exactly? Well, that's a good question. And I don't think that there is an answer. Whoever they were, they left behind a language that can't be read. We photographed it and studied it as best we can. And we've given it to some of the best minds on earth. And no one knows what it is. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a language lost to time. And these people, whoever they were, they didn't just stumble upon the ability to make water like this. You know, another thing that should be considered is where this water was going. It was going to Cajamarca, which has some of the best water in the world, and it's replent with all of these medicinal hot springs. What was so special about that water coming from some high Andean glacial lake that they would go to that much trouble to take it down to Cajamarca, where they already have plenty of water? What was the point in that? And these, these people, they knew how to do this. And that's not the sort of thing you stumble upon accidentally. That's a, that's a developed trait. That's science. That is an, an evolution of understanding, you see. It's just one of the many curious things that we found. We found what would what I would call a highway, and I, I think anybody would call it a highway, really. Highways that go between lost cities, one mountain to the next, paved with a curb and nice gliding down one mountain, across the way and up this other side of the mountain to the next lost city. One city after another, after another, after another. And they were connected with this kind of a highway. And we've seen it. Now, speaking of highway, um, Eric Van Daniken and, of course, other writers have talked about the Nazca lines um, of actually being uh, some sort of maybe landing strip or, or a, a field. Uh, is there any evidence that they had uh, aerial travel? Well, yeah, I'd say there is. I'd say there is. The holes of Humai, for example, that there, there's something very, very damn peculiar about the holes of Humai. Well, can but, you describe those? Okay, I will. Then I want to go to this next thing, because I think this ties in and it's really important. Okay. The holes of Humai, it was going around the internet several years ago. And from satellite images, if you go look, I mean, go watch on Expeditions TV, for Christ's sake. Look at Secrets, <clears throat> Secrets in the Sand. Uh, it, it's free. You can go watch it. It's no big deal. Watch this. You'll see the holes of Humai. From satellite photography, you see these holes very neatly going in a straight line. <clears throat> and you can see from Google Earth, it's going what appears to be up a mountain. So people were saying, oh, I bet UFOs or extraterrestrials did this or some giant machine poked holes in the ground. You know, a lot of stories. Maybe it was, the imagination goes wild when you see something like this. And, and truly, there's a good reason why it goes wild. You've never seen anything like this in your life. And you stumble upon it. Oh, hell yeah, you're going to go crazy trying to imagine what the hell this is. Well... Okay, let's go find out. Kathy and I were living in Peru. We had a car. We packed it up, and we took off. We had a mission. We had several places we were going, and we just added Humai to it. We got there, found our way to this place. A lot of stories to tell about that, but let's focus on Humai. What you have are holes that are one meter across and one meter deep. But they're not exactly holes, all of them, because it's an irregular terrain. So you have like a desert landscape, and the soil is as hard as cement. It really is. And there are rocks all over the place. Some of these rocks are just part of the soil that broke apart. And where the irregular features of the landscape exist, they took rocks and built it up so that it would be one meter across, one meter deep at very regular intervals. So why did they do this? We couldn't figure it out at all. It went right up the damn mountain. It was not easy. 
Off to the left of those holes, there is an old gold mine. And it's, you know, it's, it's much newer than the holes. So some folks say, well, maybe it was for, for burying the dead. No, we found the hole where people were thrown, where the dead were buried. They weren't buried in these holes. Every one of these holes have been examined. There were no dead bodies in there of any kind. The holes were actually kept quite clean, which was another curiosity. Eventually, what Kathy discovered is that those holes are absolutely pointing <clears throat> to the true north and south of the earth. Right dead zero center, boom, right in the very center of the poles, both north and south. And if you were to draw a line, you could get an absolute barrier north and south. That's all we know about it. Now, you ask about the glyphs in the Nazca lines. The Nazca lines are more recent, and I think they're boring. They're fascinating. We've been there. We've checked them out very carefully. And I can guarantee you, when you go walking out on the plains of Nazca, it doesn't matter what time of day it is, it is absolutely hot as hell. <laughs> you cannot drink enough water. Well, what's boring about the Nazca lines is that the people, the Nazca people, were, in many instances, overriding older lines that were there, older glyphs. If you go just a little bit, let me think, what direction would that be? I think it's south. No, 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 it's north. If you go just a little north of Nazca, you end up in a pulpa desert. It's just on the other side of a mountain. And you see all kinds of very strange glyphs. And if you really study, go down to about five meters by five meters and start scanning through that desert like Kathy did. What you'll find is that there are really, really old glyphs that are far more interesting and in many cases, the Nazca people went and kind of brushed over them a little bit, made their own line. One of those lines that is absolutely fascinating and beyond belief, of course it's nice to see the hummingbird, the whale, the spider, the astronaut, and all that. I mean, those are really amazing to see for the first time, but nothing compared to Pulpa. On the plains of Pulpa, on a plateau all by itself, there is a geoglyph, and it is a mathematical symbol that is a formula. And from the air, it looks as though it were drawn on a flat surface. It's very understandable. And we have lots of pictures, and you can go find it yourself. I mean, if you take a look at that video I was just telling you about, Secrets, Secrets, in, uh, Secrets of the Sand at Expeditions.tv, You'll see it, but what you don't see, unless you're there, or maybe if you watch the video, you'll get an idea, what you'll see is that this is a very irregular piece of territory, and it's just older than God. It really is. And all these stones are precisely piled in little pyramids, and the little pyramids are precisely placed to create boxes. And circles and diameters are crafted in such a way that it explains a formula. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. After we release the information about that, and we're not the only ones who ever have. It's not like, oh, we made the big discovery. It wasn't that. We went there and took a look at it firsthand. We did that. There was a scientist that contacted us and said, this is fascinating. Where did you say you found this? And I told him. He was a mathematician. And he said, well, the geometry of this is exactly the way that I explain a water molecule. Mm. And so he sent us his geometry and his mathematics. We took a look. And while there were more things in the glyph, in Pulpa, the Pulpa Desert, his overlaid it precisely. 
without exception. What these other aspects of the glyph are, we don't have any idea. But the one thing that is quite fascinating about that entire desert region, Tim, is that underground there's a network of tunnels. And these tunnels have been created to carry water from nobody knows where. But it's always cool and it's always fresh. Well, you know, I uh, now I know you've had some UFO observations while you've been in some of these locations. Do you think that there's a tie-in with these uh, unknown uh, objects and with these ancient civilizations? Is that why they're, could they have been related? Could they have been traveling and, and landing uh, there uh, uh, thousands of years ago? I think maybe. There, there's got to be some connection like that. But let's let's be clear on on. UFOs, extraterrestrials, and these these uh, cultures, because what I have come to believe is the case in in many instances down there with these lost cities and this advanced knowledge is that there are two things happening, Tim. One is that yes, there are extraterrestrials, and you know, they're as, as varied as the M&Ms and a pack of M&Ms for what they are. They're all extraterrestrials from this place or that. But there are also people who are coming here to this world who have a lineage here. And about 38 to 40,000 years ago, they left because something was about to happen to this planet. Mm-hmm. They left and they went back to the star of origin, which Wayne Herschel has very um, has very cleverly figured out, and then they came back, and here we are. We sur- there were those who survived those catastrophic times, and we found. Ev- now, are are we talking about a flood? No, no, about. Uh, trying to remember exact dates. Let's just speak in round numbers because I don't want yeah. to be. I don't want to quote something and misquote it. Let's say uh, 50,000 years ago, there was a supernova very close to Earth. Uh, by close, I'm talking a light year, thereabouts. Fast forward another 6,000 years, and by that time, here comes debris from the supernova. Well, when the supernova went off, part of the Earth was pointed that direction. And the gamma radiation sterilized everything that was on that side of the Earth. And we're talking about the Asiatic and um, uh, Australian side of the Earth. So fast forward, and there's, there's absolute proof of this. It isn't like we're making a speculation. There's even an absolute date for it. I'm, I just don't remember it. So fast forward about 5,000, 6,000 years. And here comes the debris field. We're about to move through it. When a supernova goes kaplowy, it's going to be spraying stuff in all directions. Well, we're going to be intersecting that at some point. And about 5,000 years later, roughly, yeah, we're starting to get close to that debris field. It was a very damning situation. It was going to really just do some huge, horrific damage to the Earth. And the people who were here had space travel. They were going between stars. They didn't really start out on this world anyway. So they could travel as they pleased. Some of them decided to remain behind to help whoever remained behind to reestablish themselves. And the rest of them left. So what I think we see here, we see people who are, in in a very real respect, our ancestors who are visiting, and probably they're part of the reason why a lot of these anomalies are in South America and some of these other places uh, around the Earth. And of course, then there are the extraterrestrials. But one of the things you find down there, especially Pulpa, Nazca, and that region, you find people who have either wrapped a baby's head to make it look like it was a cone-shaped, 
Mm -hmm. You find that they actually had a cone-shaped skull. And when you find a cone-shaped skull, there are uh, very distinct differences between a regular skull and a cone-shaped skull. And that's also mentioned and, and illustrated clearly on that video I just mentioned. Different number of sutures and plates, for one thing. That's right. <laughs> well, uh, guys, we're going to have to uh, have a cliffhanger here because uh, we're coming up on a break in uh, just a few seconds. So, uh, Tim, let's go to that, and right. we will be right back with more Exploring the Bazaar. Now back to Exploring the Bazaar with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal, your hosts, Timothy, Timothy Beckley, Beckley and Tim Swartz. You know, all this talk of giants and lost races sends a chill right up and down my spine. I, you know, this has got to be one of the most fascinating topics uh, that we've ever delved uh, into. Uh, and uh, we've got two very fascinating guests uh, on this evening. We've got Rick Osman. Uh, who's in Indiana, and we've got uh, Jerry uh, Wills from Phoenix, and uh, Kathy Wills uh, in the background uh, monitoring uh, uh, Facebook, and of course my co-host Tim Schwartz. Now, you know, uh, Jerry, I, I have to ask you this. Now, uh, there have been uh, appearances of U uh, UFOs over some of these uh, uh, sites that you've visited. What what have you seen uh, that have tied in uh, with uh, these uh, these vehicles or uh, craft. Have you seen seen anything over these these uh, uh, lay, uh, over the lines that exist there in NASCAR or any of these other places in the Andes? Oh, I've I've seen plenty of UFOs in South America. You know, both lights in the sky, like oh, gee, that's a UFO. All the way to something landing, a little lake things popping out and people getting out of it uh, and how close how close were you to that not as close as i'd like to have been it was an afternoon at machu picchu and this is cloudy you know broken clouds it's just beautiful there anyway the sky is a beautiful color of blue here comes this thing floating down out of the sky it looks like a I don't know, like shiny chrome. Floats down through the clouds, lands on a saddleback on the mountain that's called Machu Picchu, which the village down there, the, the ruins are named after that mountain. Off to the right of the peak of Machu Picchu, there's a saddleback, and this thing landed right there. Everybody saw it. People were videotaping it, taking pictures best they could. And after it sat there for a few minutes, then you didn't see the door open, but you saw these people step out from underneath of it and walk around like they were talking and pointing. Then they walked over to a rock and sat on the rock, and they watched us while we watched them. That's just one. There were quite a few other instances as well. There's a place yeah. called um, Waipo. And UFOs fly in and out of the lake there at Waipo. I've taken people to, La it's a, a lake, Lago, or Lake, Lago Waipo. I've taken people there many times at night so we could watch UFOs fly in and out of the lake. You know, we can see, you know, gee, it has this edge to it, and you can see the dome and all that. No, 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 no. It was bright lights that were intelligently controlled that would fly right over us or go fly out along the mountains. That's happened quite a number of times. A lot of people go there to see that. Um, I've seen a UFO land on a distant glacier and light it up. Had a few things fly right over the top of us at Markawasi. Almost every occasion at Markawasi you see something. That's a weird, weird place. But yeah, you see UFOs flying around Markawasi. Typical flying saucer types. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of sightings down there. 
So now uh, I want to ask Rick are these uh, places that you that you visited here in the uh, in North America. Have there been strange phenomena associated with any of these places? Well, yes, uh, certainly. If you take a sensitive person to some of these places, sometimes you get the whole story of why that mound was built, as an example, and how many people are in it, and why one of them is special. But I don't have that ability. So I go with the scientific stuff, and although we don't dig in these mounds, we use non, non-intrusive testing methods that can give us an idea of, <clears throat> well... How many people are buried here, and is one of them kind of a special burial? And recently, I've started using an age-old method that I never had much stock in until, well, just about a year ago, um, dowsing. And I've had some success with that part of it. So when we had the strange phenomena occurring on these particular structures because they are artificial structures you have everything from sightings of uh, linda godfrey's wolf man up in wisconsin to ufos of course and of course bigfoot sightings near mounds as well as little people sightings near mounds um which i find pretty fascinating ufos well it's kind of hard to tell if they're there for the mound you know because they don't get get out and do a ceremony or anything, as far as we know. But there have been sightings. Well, I I know um, um, up up in uh, New England there are these uh, kind of mysterious chambers. Yeah. Uh, that date back. Well, nobody knows exactly who put them up. The uh, uh, or how how far they actually date back. But there have been uh, several stories that have been related to me, including uh, by uh, park rangers about people who have been staying overnight in the area who would actually hear voices coming from inside these structures or have seen uh, strange objects shooting across the sky and hovering above these uh, chambers. Yes, I've heard those same stories. I don't know how to attribute it. Well, it's almost as if... Now, they claim also, too, that the local uh, tribes, even though they did not... um, uh, build the uh, the structures themselves. They did use the uh, them for ritualistic purposes, In some and cases, that uh, the, yes. uh, yeah, and that uh, the uh, the shamans uh, would go in there and have uh, you know rituals and would communicate or commune with uh, some uh, spirits or other uh, strange phenomena. So apparently there had been something going there had been something going on in these areas for a long, long time, and in kind of it's just been kind of passed down from uh, one group to another. Yes. Well, you, you also have, they're concentrated in mostly Vermont, New Hampshire, but they're in New York, maybe a couple even in Maine. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, that, that state is still more woolly than Indiana is. But the, the occurrence of strange phenomena with these structures, not just with the, the underground beehive type structures that you find in New England and American Stonehenge, <clears throat> in New Hampshire, um, any place that you have these sites, there is the potential for high strangeness. Um, but I'm not particularly sensitive to it, like, well, my wife and a few other folks that I know. So the the dowsing thing is new to me. I'm still getting used to that. But I've been able to douse maps for sites and whatnot. It's it's pretty fascinating. What uh, what kind of instrument are you using, Rick? Rods. Oh, okay. All right. And in my case, it's ancient copper rods. So. Now, have you have you studied? Are you familiar with the uh, the ley line phenomena? I would say that yeah, I've studied it, but <clears throat> I'm more on a level of familiarity than uh, you know, an astute attendant to it. Now, would you say that there is uh, any uh, truth to the concept that uh, a lot of these uh, ancient uh, sites are on these ley lines, these energy sources? Yes. Um, Particularly, well, let's go with the Bighorn Medicine Wheel as an example. It's one of the biggest medicine wheels. It is the biggest one I know of um, that's made of stone, at least. And it follows at least three different ley lines. 
which puts it at a unique spot on North America. Um, and it, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how to explain ley lines. I only know that it seems to have been important to somebody who was building something wherever they were building it. You know, you, you, you go to the Freemasons as an example. It's a modern society, right? But they claim heritage going back to, well, King Solomon. <clears throat> and they build their lodge on the cardinal directions with everything inside laid out so that everybody's doing the same thing in every lodge in the same directions. So those things are still important at some level in today's society. Well, you know, I always, uh, I always tell people uh, when they ask me, you know, like, you know, oh, where can I go to, you know, to, to see a UFO or something like that? And, you know, I always, I always say, well, you know, find, uh, uh, find like an ancient site, you know, nearby and spend a yeah. little time, spend a little time in that location. And I said, sure. you know, it, uh, you know, there's, there's no guarantee you see something, but you'll have, I, you know, I've said you'll have a better chance a lot of times, you know, uh, at, at these locations, see a UFO or, or in one case, uh, you know, as you know, Rick, uh, um, up at the, uh, the Anderson, uh, burial yeah. mounds, you know, uh, little people. <laughs> yep. Go see as the one Pugis. example. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they <clears throat> we had that discussion. I was in uh western New York speaking with a member of the Seneca tribe about that. They have a different name because it's a different language. But they um they attribute a lot of good things to their little people. Mm -hmm. Unless you piss them off. Yeah, <laughs> that, <laughs> and they're and they're and they're easily honked off too. <laughs> Apparently so. Yes. Yeah, it doesn't take much. Hey, uh, Jerry, I wanted to ask you: um, Have you and your wife ever uh, uh, looked at or investigated any uh, ancient sites uh, here in the United States? You know, like uh, Sedona or someplace like that. I mean, Sedona, I know, is not an ancient site, but <laughs> <laughs> just use that as an example. <laughs> the site for ancient people, though. There you go. <laughs> Be good. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that we were looking into, Kathy was deep into the research for about three and a half years, almost four, was the Lost City in the Grand Canyon. Uh, we were looking into that <clears throat> to find out what the reality was, what the truth was. I think we finally satisfied ourselves on that one. And beyond that, you know, one of the more strange places is that Crystal Plateau in southern Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, they call it the Doorway of the Gods. It's very strange. And, yeah, we've, we've been down there and taken a look at that. It's been a few years back now that we did that. Uh, we're thinking about going back later this year, probably late October, early November, if we have time. But yeah, I mean, we we have looked around, you know, with the the, uh, the oh, I can't remember the name of this the stone. There, there's a thing. Well, we've been we've been looking at quite a few different strange things. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, we travel have traveled all over the United States, and during our travels. You know, there are places along the way to check out. Well, we've we've had uh, Tom Dongo on our show uh, a couple of times. Of course, he's uh, uh, our main contact down there in Sedona. And uh, they had an area there where I guess they're still having some uh, UFO activity. But for a couple of years, it was like the major hotspot. In fact, uh, he and um, I believe it was Kathy Bradshaw took numerous dozens and dozens of photos of... of uh, Weird objects. I mean, in the sky, on the ground, in the trees, uh, over the Bradshaw uh, Ranch, uh, and I, just very, very peculiar things that have happened uh, there. You know, but it never really. Uh, I asked him, you know, one time if it ever gets any attention in the press down there, and uh, apparently not. I mean, the locals, some of the locals know about it, and of course, others just kind of poo poo the whole uh, entire, uh, you know, uh, idea. How about the Superstition Mountains, Jerry? Any vibe on that? You know, that's a, that's a real strange place. 
That's a very strange place. We haven't really done much around the superstitions because it's it's difficult. That's it's one of the more harsh and and people disappear. Well, they do, and you know sometimes they disappear just because they're stupid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, don't go into a place like that carrying as much water as as you weigh. You carry enough water on the horse for as much as you weigh. But. Uh, no, the superstitions are, are terrifically interesting and, and very strange. We know that there are some things in the superstitions that sometimes, you know, if you were going to go in there and see some of the places we know about, it would take three, four, five days to get in and get out again. It, it, it's a huge place. And some of the things in there are so ancient that it's just astonishing. Well, we got to go find the lost Dutchman mind. <laughs> there you go. It's already been found. Has it? Yeah, it has. And the, uh, uh, where, where, and and was there a vast sum of uh, taken out of there, treasures and gold? Oh, sure. Well, see this, this whole thing about the lost Dutchman mine. Um, it it hasn't been made public knowledge, but it belongs to the Apaches. It's on their reservation. And what was so spectacular? about this was uh, the gold. It was in a volcanic vent and it was not gold dust or small chunks of gold. It was a volcanic vent that was lined with gold. And anyone who might stumble upon it and find it is never going to talk about it because they won't live to get out of there. Hmm. The Apaches own it. And they're not, they're, they're not sharing <clears throat> well, apparently they're going to share some of the uranium, though. Well, that's... Not by choice. Yeah, I'm sure that... that uh, I don't know about that in particular, so I really can't address it. Well, what about... Okay, now this is... Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're rapidly coming to the end of our, our program here. And I just, I just have a quick question that both, you know, uh, uh, Rick and Jerry can, can try to answer is... What is it about South America that I mean? We have all of these 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 huge, absolutely marvelous structures that you know we can still see and and, and we're discovering all all the time. You know, there in the jungles and stuff. But but North America, uh, not so much. What's what's the difference? I mean, you know, if if you go by you know what the archaeologists say. Uh, you know, the Native Americans came down from Siberia and came through North America first. You would think that uh, that we would have uh, the those same kind of uh, of, of you know uh, sites as they do it down in South America. What's so special? Mm. <laughs> wow, great question. <laughs> uh, I would start with most of what had been built before about 1000 A.D. was destroyed by 1000 A.D. Mm. Um, start with that one, and then with Poverty Point, Louisiana being one exception. Mm -hmm. uh, but pretty much, as Jerry alluded earlier, there have been a number of restarts, probably due to, you know, cal calamitous whatever, uh, meteor strikes, asteroid strikes, who knows? Um, supernovas. Yeah. Supernova, yeah, coronal mass ejections of the utmost kind. Anything can disrupt a civilization, and I don't, and I don't call it a civilization because of technology. Sure. It's because you can communicate. By whatever. Could, it, could a disaster of that magnitude happen again? Certainly. At any moment. I mean, we're going into a, a sunspot dark period. There are no sunspots. We're going into a cold phase. Um, if that goes extreme, if it lasts, say, a decade... We're done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and really, take a look at our technology and where we are. If there were something that knocked out our power grid, we're going to be pretty helpless. Everything that we depend upon is going to be gone. Whether it's electricity, computers, phones, calling, you name it. It's going to be light switches. Yeah, it, it, freezers, refrigerators, 
if you're going to put information on something that's going to last and you realize, oh, well, we just lost electricity and we have you know very limited resources now, what are we going to do? Because we have to warn the people of the future because we just figured out that this can happen again. And it's going to, and we calculated it's going to be right about this period of time right here. <laughs> we have to make sure that the paper it's written on is going to last. Well, it's not going to be paper. We're going to put it on stone. Yep. Well, gentlemen, we are getting close to the end of this very fascinating program. And I want to give each of you the opportunity. Uh, Jerry, tell us where people can find uh, your uh, programs and what expeditions you might have coming up, what, what you're involved in currently. Uh, no expeditions coming up right now. We're talking about maybe doing something late October in southern Arizona. People can find... Kathy and I at expeditions.tv. That's X P starts with an X, folks. X P E D I T I O N S dot TV. If you like rock and roll or Yay, the, we certainly do. Then go to <laughs> go find Jeff Bird Project, B Y R D, Jeff Bird Project dot com or iHeartRadio. We have our own channel there, Jeff Bird Project. Uh, what else is coming up? Well, I don't know. Since we're to our newsletter, we'll make the announcement. Uh, how many how many shows do you have on your TV channel? I don't. Uh, there's lots of them. You know, quite a few. Uh, the The video documentaries. I think we're up to about fourteen on those. And within the member section at Expeditions TV, I think we have twenty or thirty radio shows on there now. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, Rick, what's on your agenda? Wow. Uh, let's see. August 11th, 12th, 13th, I'll be in Nauvoo, Illinois for Honoring Ancient Ancestors Conference out there, uh, along with a number of folks that might be familiar to some of your listeners, Hutton Pulitzer, recently of uh, History Channel, mm -hmm. and um, Lee Pennington, who is also a documentary videographer of note. And he's poet lord of Commonwealth of Kentucky a number of years back. Um, let's see. I don't even remember who all's going to be. And, and, and what, what is your topic of discussion? This ancient communications network. So I'll be explaining with slides how it all worked, or could have worked at least. Mm -hmm. and, and your your books are available? What, what are some of the titles? Um well, the one book that is solo right now is on Amazon. It is The Graves of the Golden Bear, Ancient Fortresses and Monuments of the Ohio Valley. It's in its second edition now. I have, I think, maybe five copies of the first edition left. Um, and, of course, I'm writing for every issue of Ancient American Magazine, which is also sponsoring this conference in Nauvoo. Well, both of you gentlemen... Uh are, I can see you're very busy, just like Tim and I are. In <laughs> fact, Tim and I are currently uh, finishing up a project. Uh, it's called uh, Project Alien Mind Control. And uh, that'll be our next uh, title out. And uh, we've just released a couple of weeks ago Nazi UFO Time Travelers, which is doing very well, and an updated edition of the Philadelphia Experiment Revelations. <laughs> and Tim, anything uh, you, you uh, want us to know about before we sign off and go back to the lost civilization oh, you made it. oh, you oh made that's it. right next next that's week, right next Jerry. week next week we're having frank and tanya on and you're in you're in the movie that they made jerry on mars oh that's right yeah, yeah. that was a very good movie too yeah uh, yeah so that'll be our topic of discussion uh next week we've got some right. great programs coming up you know we, ju we just don't let a minute slide here we're, we give you two hours of the most exciting enthralling information that's why it's exploring the bazaar good night good night everybody thank night. you thanks you've been listening to exploring the bazaar with hosts timothy beckley and tim swartz they're taking back the night by jetting non-stop across the cosmos in search of the truly bizarre and totally unexplained with you as their co pilot Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern.
Manchester on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. For more information on exploring the bazaar and hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz, check out their KCOR Digital Radio Network page. Follow their YouTube channel at MRUFO1100. Exploring the bazaar.